Hello comrades, we're back in the studio. And I'm really yeah. pleased to welcome as our first guest, Duncan Shipley Dalton, uh, who is a member of the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers, and I believe has read through the leaked report and has read through the uh, Ford report, which took about two years to produce um, after the leaked report came out, uh, which was a long, long, long process. We actually, all of us thought uh, it, it was buried, etc. But um, I don't think they actually needed to bury it because the, the tenor of the Ford report is quite even-handed. It's saying, yes, there was weaponization of anti-Semitism, but you know, it was done by the left and the right. And there were two factions and they were fighting each other. And you know, it's a shame. It's, that's what the Labour Party had come to. There was a wrangling, a left against the right. And it's almost like back to normal now that, that the left has been defeated. So the Ford report was interesting in that it, it uh, confirmed what most of us knew, of course. There was sabotage, widespread sabotage against Corbyn from Labour HQ, from the regions, from the bureaucracy, from the, in the, the, the uh, compliance unit, etc. Um, there were sabotage against us. Um, and we, we all noticed it. We were all wic victims of it. Uh, it led to the defeat of Corbyn in the 2019 election, and first 2017, actually, and then uh, 2019. And, of course, it led to the witch hunt, the wave of expulsions, etc. Uh, Duncan, you've, you've read both reports. What's, what's your take on, on it, and what kind of political lessons are you drawing from it? Yes, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, yeah, I, I did read the uh, leaked report as well as the board report. Oh, uh, Duncan, there's something in your background. Is that? Do you have something running in your? Ah, oh, it's, it's switched off now. Sorry, that's that's better now. The audio is better now. Thank you. Have we lost Duncan? Okay, so. We've lost sound on the Zoom for a second, it appears. So we're going to talk to Tony first. Hello, Tony. You're a bit out of breath because you're late, aren't you? <laughs> but, but thank you for joining us. We were just um, talking about the leaked report and the Ford report. And um, we, unfortunately, we couldn't show the video of Jeremy Corbyn talking about the Ford report on Saturday. I don't know if you've seen it. But I presume yeah. we would be you be coming to a different assessment assessment than Jeremy Corbyn does. I mean, Jeremy will um, no doubt uh, will have. Oh, you need to be mic'd in. Sorry. Oh God. Let yes. our, um, our tech guy mic you in quickly. Um, yes. So Jeremy Corbyn was, uh, of course, um, suspended and had the whip withdrawn, uh, rather ironically, on a charge. Uh, of saying the anti-Semitism had been overplayed and um, weaponized, which is of course the same charge that was leveled against Chris Williamson, and um, he's uh, he was suspended from it. We've got now Duncan back. Is it <laughs> okay, Tony? You can catch your breath, and I'm going to talk to Duncan first. Sorry about that, guys. We've the whole day was so smooth, and suddenly we're back with technical problems again. Thank you for joining us, Duncan. I, I hear you're the latest one, actually, to be uh, coming to the uh, Witch Hunters radar. Yes, yes, it, it seems so. Yes, I've, uh, I was expelled uh, last week. Oh, God, sorry to hear that. Solidarity, comrade. Yeah, well, you know, I, I sort of expected it to happen anyway, so I've been waiting on it for a while. Um, yeah. Not, well, no, we'll see what I do about it yet. I haven't decided, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how far I want to go in challenging. Uh, okay, back to Ford. I think the point that I actually wanted to pick on particularly today was the um, chapter at section E, which is at page 101 of uh, Ford's report on culture, structure and practices uh, of labour. Um, and particularly he identified that there was a, what he was surprised by how toxic the atmosphere was in the party, um, that this was linked to an entrenched factionalism, uh, that he also identified there were problems with poor recruitment practices uh, and that he then made suggestions that there should be educational and awareness building and uh, facilitated um, discussions with people to, in order to try and improve that. 
Uh, and he also had made a suggestion about um, underpinning it with fundamental ethical principles that would be uh, put into either a staff code of practice or, I, I guess, uh, possibly the rules. Um, there was, of course, also quite a lot of evidence there of particularly discriminatory attitudes that were uh, taken by some members of staff uh, and others within the party and reports from um, staff members from the uh, BMME ME, uh, community who were saying how they were treated very badly. Uh, those who were Muslim had found that, you know, their, the attitude towards their faith and giving them time and space, for instance, to pray uh, uh, during the day wasn't, you know, wasn't facilitated by the party at all. So, but what I want to think about on this is it's very easy, and I think Ford makes a mistake here in that he looks at this as very much a, uh, bad actors, individuals problem. Um, and I think what you have to do is think about it in terms of systems and a systems approach, not uh, simply looking at bad actors. Um, and to take a quote from Paul Anderson, the American writer, he says, I've yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when you look at it in the right way, did not become still more complicated. Uh, Donna Meadow, or Donella Meadows, um, wrote a book on thinking in systems and you know, a system is an interconnected set of elements that coherently organize to achieve something. So you've got your elements, your interconnections, your function and purpose. And that's one of the most important points is the function and purpose of this. So if you think of as an example, a football team, a football team is a group of 11 men or more successfully women <laughs> who are playing football as a team. Uh, and the elements of that team are the players, the managers and the staff make up the elements. The interconnections being then the way the players communicate and work with each other, the strategy the manager lays down, um, and the rules of the game and so on. The purpose that the team has, well, there could be many purposes. It could be just to do well in a particular competition. So if you take, you know, um, the European Championships, I mean, some of the teams went there just to have, to have fun, really, and to do as best they could, but not expecting to win. Uh, so, you know, what actually is set as purpose, but the way that you can determine the purpose is by looking at what exactly the behaviour is of the the uh, system in order to then identify how it's focused around achieving yeah. its purpose. So, I think, OK, the system is probably the, it's the sum of its parts. It's the, uh, and it can have adaptive, dynamic, goal-seeking, self-preserving, and sometimes uh, evolutionary behavior as part of it. Um, now, within the interconnections, a lot of that resolves around flows of information as well. So signals that go to decision points within the system are important, um, and they tend, they hold the system together. Um, now, obviously, within a system, you can have subsystems as well. So it isn't simply a matter of one system. It can be multiple subsystems, many of which can have different purposes and then exhibit different behaviours in order to achieve their particular purpose, but linked into the wider purpose or the wider behaviour of the system. The system as well can be operating literally uh, on its own without any human actors actually directing what the system is supposed to achieve. So it isn't a matter of a single uh, individual or, you know, Keir Starmer um, directing each and everything that happens within the Labour Party. The, the Labour Party is a complex system that operates. And in a lot of these purposes, things that it's carrying out as a system, uh, I, I would say that it, it's uh, not simply a case of somebody or even a group directing, completely directing control. Now, uh, I, don't, I know you might be familiar with it, but Robert Michels, the uh, German writer who, sociologist, wrote in 1911 um, his book called The Political Parties, a sociological study of the oligarchical tendencies of modern democracy. And his uh, suggestion was that political parties, large organisations, because of the nature of their size, as they grow, they develop bureaucratic structures. So that's a, it becomes a rational, predictable organisation and will develop a hierarchical structure. Um, the problem of large scale organizations like that is that because they are large organizations with large administrative uh, matters to manage, they uh, have to develop this kind of bureaucracy. But the price of that democracy, or, or sorry, of that bureaucracy rather, is that it concentrates the power with the, in the hierarchy and at the top of the organization. Uh, and the mass membership of that organization don't have the same or don't have control 
or even really power to direct what is being done by the leadership cadre who have who occupy the positions. Now, the problem you have is that within a professionalised bureaucracy, uh, those people who take up the staff positions, who take up the positions, parliamentary representatives, you know, senior officer positions within the party, so on, they are uh, in those positions because they have the capacity to exercise both. It's quite often some kind of technical skill, and um, they've been. You know, they have them can put time into it as well. I mean, a lot of them being professional at it, whereas the mass membership generally is not heavily involved in the activity mm. of the party. I mean, Duncan, wouldn't, wouldn't sort of transparency and, uh, you know, like an accountability and people being elected, <laughs> wouldn't that help? I mean, you know, the, the, these regions, they were, uh, and the report says that the regions were staffed by people that Ian McNichol put in, didn't he? And to reflect mm -hmm. his political views. But I mean, you know, if they were re recallable, accountable, and we could, could have gotten rid of them, we wouldn't have quite that problem. I don't think the size necessarily matters, does it, of an organisation? Well, the, the size create because of the the nature of the scale of the organization there's a certain inevitability towards this kind of bureaucratic structure um, and then the problem that you have is that the um, those people in those professional staff positions on will become divorced from uh, the the wider wishes of mass membership and what you get instead is that those persons who occupy those senior leadership positions within the party rather even though they may come it, as from a social background that puts them um, alongside ma the mass membership, um, and they may come from a working class background. When they enter into the party in that way and take up those senior positions, they actually become part of the power elite instead. And they become a, a power class that occupy a position that is differentiated from the mass membership. And in that way, um, you have the problem that they then don't necessarily see that their interest is served, or rather is in line with the uh, mass membership. Mm. The interests they seek to, to perpetuate are their own interests. Mm. Um, There's certainly, I think, I think you're right to identify it as a danger. And of course, Ford uh, mentioned that in his, in his report. It certainly is a danger uh, that we also find in the, in the trade union movement, where it's all focused on the trade union secretary. And he has, she has a lot of power whereas the membership, the normal membership, is almost uh, silenced. But uh, to, to, to uh, sum up this now, for you, having read the, the leaked report and the Ford report, what is for you the, the key issue, the key lesson, political lesson, that, that the left can learn from, from, the de from our defeat in those seven years? Well, I think, I think the key lesson here is that un unless you actually analyse why the parties behaved in the way it has, and more importantly, why do the individuals in the party who are in these senior staff positions actually behave in the way that they do? Do they behave in that way because they're just simply bad actors who are bad people and it can be cured by sending them to an education class where they'll be told how naughty they are and have a you know a hug and a clap and everybody will go home completely changed in their attitudes? Or are they behaving in this way because uh, the, the systemic structure and the well, the psychological pressures that people are under in those organisations is such that it's going to create that behaviour. The point with systems versus looking at bad actors is that a system will perpetuate itself over time. So now we have a problem with the Labour Party behaving in this way, but quite likely, if you look at it, you'd have the same problem 25 years ago and you'll have the same problem 30 years into the future. It's, it's nothing will change by looking just at trying to deal with individuals unless you understand what was the purpose that was served by it and shift that purpose and therefore, you know, potentially shift, maybe shift parts of the structure in order to achieve a new purpose and get, get it directed towards a new purpose. You won't actually change it. You won't change it by just changing out the individuals. And that's where I think Ford is wrong. Because what Ford is suggesting is basically sending people off on happy, clappy education classes that will make them not racist anymore. Well, it doesn't work like that. So... I don't see that the, the suggestions that have been made in relation to party culture actually would go anywhere. Um, and more likely, the culture that's already there, because it's linked into the, the long-term purpose and the objectives of the leadership cadre of the party, who basically are there to serve themselves as part of a power elite that they, you know, that they occupy as part of the leadership. 
then nothing will actually change. That's how I see it. Okay, thank you very much, Duncan. It's certainly a, a different lesson than, I, than I've drawn from the Ford report, but you know we're all different, and it's a, it's a, it's good to hear different different viewpoints. I myself, I'm a, I'm a big fan of political organisation, and the bigger the better. I think unless we have mass membership of in 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 our parties and our unions, uh, we we can never uh, be you know strong enough to to defeat the ruling class and the, the question for me is always democracy and accountability and transparency and that you know that leaders are not there for five years or even longer uh, but they can constantly be uh, you know challenged and can be can be uh, replaced when when they don't do what we want them to do and that you have on all levels you have that kind of accountability i think that's a that's a better way education on the other hand i think is is quite important uh, and you know if it had been proper education of course what what ford um, was saying i believe i mean he wanted the jvl to to play some role in education because uh, Keir Starmer gave the 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 education on anti-semitism he handed over to the jewish um, labor movement which is of course uh, a subsidiary to the uh, Israeli state and I'm going to talk to Tony Greenstein in the studio about this uh, in more detail. Um, for you, um, I believe, I mean, you know, the, the, what's, what's for you to sum up the key lesson for you from, from both the leaked report and, and the Ford report? Well, firstly, maybe I can just reply to Duncan on yes. the question of the problem of the permanent staff in the Labour Party. Mm. I don't think it's inevitable that the staff would behave in the way they do, even however large or small the organisation is. The problem in the Labour Party is that the permanent staff are there to police the membership, mm. whereas the relationship should be the opposite way round. It's the membership who should be telling their staff what they want them to do. And as long as you have a situation, I mean, in Brighton, we saw on the Al Jazeera Labour files, you had the largest ever AGM, 600 people in one hall, who voted democratically, two to one, to replace the existing officers with a new set of officers. And if you look at the Labour leak report, uh, page 113, they were have it in, on my memory even, Stolliday says, bunch of trots and the SWP marching from a rally. We've got to overturn this. Karen Buckingham, who's conducted the investigation into the allegations, said, yes, we've got to do this. Fuck the rules. We're going to sort them out. We can think about the legalities later. They had the power to overturn a democratic decision of over 600 people. That is something that is wrong. That is a... That is a problem of the Labour Party itself. And that revolves, of course, around the politics of the Labour Party and how it's traditionally operated. That the permanent staff, the more senior the better, were in charge of the witch hunts of anyone who was a socialist, a genuine socialist, I mean. Uh, so that is it. I mean, as far as the Labour leaked report is concerned, it obviously contained a lot of useful information about... What, what was happening. You saw the racism, and incidentally, I don't believe you can educate people out of racism. It's been tried and failed. Uh, it, when they had racial awareness training for the police, it just made them better racists. They knew who their enemies were. It didn't eradicate it. We know that. I mean, from the death of uh, Chris Carber at the weekend to all the other deaths in custody, it hasn't fundamentally answered anything, but they had their training. So they know how better to answer the responses when they're pulled up. I mean, it, it, it doesn't do anything more. To educate racists like Emily Oldno and all the others, Neil McNichol, what would that do? It would just teach them to understand how to better say things, if you like. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't change their politics fundamentally. And, and that is the problem with the Labour Party. And that's the problem with Ford, in a sense. Because Ford, he talks about factionalism. But he really doesn't get it. There was a battle over the soul with the Labour Party. Do you have a, a new socialist regime which is actually going to fulfil some of the things that the, the founders of the Labour Party believed in? You know, whatever you say about Clause 4, it, it had the basics of socialism. The, the workers by hand or brain would control the economy and things like that. 
there was a battle between the supporters of capitalism and those who wanted if, to reform capitalism or whatever. Uh, and, I mean, because Corbyn is a fairly mild social democrat. He's not a revolutionary. He's not a Marxist. But nonetheless, even Corbyn frightened the capitalists. He, he threatened their interests. Ford simply does not get on top of that. And that is his problem. So he engages in what is called both-sidism. You're equally to blame. Well, Corbyn was democratically elected. What right are the unelected staff to try and subvert and overturn him? What right did they have to, and I think Ford's wrong on this, they tried to prevent a Labour victory in 2017, diverting money into their cronies, uh, people like Tom Watson and so on, to save their seats. They had absolutely no right. So to both sides it, well, that's a decision Ford took. But it's a wrong decision and it's dishonest because it doesn't really call out who was responsible for doing what. And then to say, well, the Ergon House uh, operation where 150000 or so was spent, was money well spent uh, and what have you. I mean, it completely misses the point. So Ford was simply wrong on that. But having said that, Ford was better than I expected because I expected it to be much worse. So he has recognised that anti-Semitism was weaponised. He hasn't done much about it, but uh, but then again, much of the left didn't see that either. That's so uh, <laughs> what can you say? And also his recommendation on education for anti-Semitism to include the JVL was a red rag to a bull. And I mean, I believe it's absolute nonsense to say you need education about anti-Semitism. Why? Anti-Semitism isn't even a form of racism in Britain today. It's, it's a prejudice at best. I mean, Jewish people are not oppressed. How are they oppressed? You don't have deaths of black you know, Jewish people in custody. There's no offence in driving while Jewish. They're not economically discriminated against. Jews, there's more Jews in Parliament would, that we would be merited by their numbers in the population. So how are Jews oppressed? Of course they're not. If they identify with Israel, and that's part of their identity, and 60% say they do, then that's a reactionary identity. You don't go along with it. So Ford really never got to it, but it was better than expected. And obviously Starmer doesn't particularly like it. He, didn't, he wanted to bury it because all he was interested in was who leaked the leaked report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was his main concern. Yeah. So, I mean, but I don't accept that because of the machine or party is big, therefore the staff have no, to I act agree. in that direction. I mean, it, it really depends who controls the staff and Corbyn didn't. And one, one of the lessons, I read Tony Benn's diaries, and he said it's the first lesson of getting into government as a cabinet minister was to control the civil service. The problem with Corbyn is when McNichol offered it, when he was elected to resign, he should have seized it with both hands. Instead, he told McNichol to continue him and he made a rod for his own back. The second thing is when he was re-elected, standing against Owen Smith, remember, McNichol tried to stop him standing. He should have then turned on McNichol and said, I want your resignation because it's clear that we can't coexist. Yeah. And he didn't do any of that. And that's the problem. OK, let's um, bring in Jackie Walker, who's joining us on Zoom. Jackie, I've got, I want to discuss. Let's let's pick up on something that we didn't actually plan on, on talking about, which is the racial awareness training. As I understand, yeah. you're a racial awareness <laughs> trainer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, actually, Tony, I'm sorry. I'm really <laughs> I can't see you at the moment because my screen has been blacked out, which makes it hard to admonish you. Talking <laughs> but I am still going to admonish you. I mean, oh where your evidence that awareness raising, anti-racist training doesn't work? I mean, first of all, you'd have to decide what training, what it was you were talking about. Mm -hmm. There's a load of training, lots of training models. Many of them don't work. Most of them, I suggest to you, are totally superficial. But if you're asking me as somebody who's spent 20 years on it, you know, I used to go in and I wasn't talking to nice middle class people. I was talking to cleaners I was talking to hospital porters. I would have them, not in tens, but in 50s and 60s. And they would absolutely, evidentially, move their attitudes. Okay. Because one thing I would actually say to you, Tony, is that, you know, 
Yeah, absolutely. Racism is actually the norm in our society, but that norm is built on ignorance. Most people's racism in this country is built on utter and pure ignorance. So, I mean, I don't, I mean, on that basis, Tony, how the hell are you actually going to change people's attitudes? I mean, that's absolute nonsense. Are you a socialist or not? How are we going to train them? By putting them up against a wall and saying, if you don't change your we're going to shoot through the head or batter you down with a welly. I mean, get real, for goodness sake. But I mean, I, I mean, anyway, that's, that's that. But this. I want to go, what I'd like to do, because I actually also read the leaked report, partly because I'm in it, and I also read in detail the Ford report. And I, I get, I really get this um, trying to understand, uh, you know, South Side and the bureaucracy of Labour as a culture of bureaucracy. I get that. But I'm sorry, that's not what this is about. Uh-huh. If you read NEC minutes of the last NEC when they were talking about the Ford report, it actually came up that most most of the regional people, most of the the managers of these places, of, of these departments, are chosen because of their political bias. You can do something about that. You can do something about the fact that black people in Southside are not just underrepresented, they're virtually nowhere in terms of management systems. You can do something about the fact that even in terms of the Al Jazeera programs, which we were allowed to watch and the preview of them, you heard, and it has been reported, that the BAME workers there were in revolt because of the way they were being treated. And the way they were treated was materially and evidentially prejudicial to their to their well-being and their happiness. You can do all sorts of things. And so we could easily, if look, Starmer has just sacked Rupa Hack for saying what almost every black person would actually say about the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is basically that if you listen to him, he sounds like a white person, right? So you have this ludicrous, you have this absolute ludicrous, ludicrous vision of the leader of a party who by Ford was told that his party has an unfriendly uh, culture for black people to go into tracks, a black, uh, one of the few black cab- shadow cabinet members for pointing out what is absolutely obvious to people, which is that that uh, that this person, this chancellor, as, as well as, you know, the home secretary may have a black skin, but they do not respond politically as black people. I mean, this is just getting ludicrous. The Labour Party now, the Labour Party now is, I mean, I don't know because I've never been in the Tory party, but I know for me was one of the most racist organisations. No, I'll strike that. It is the most racist organisation I have ever had the displeasure to actually have to work with. And that's what came out of Ford. You can criticise Ford in all sorts of ways, but actually what comes out in Ford very strongly is that Labour has a real problem with anti-black and anti-Muslim behaviour. And in terms of the leaked report, you know, you know what? The leaked report was written by a whole load of people who were ex-AWL or Starmerites. And that the thing they took as read was that anti-Semitism was a huge problem for Labour. And of course it was a huge problem for Labour because it was made into a huge problem for Labour. But if if Tina would ask me the question about one of, what, what, what one of the things is I think should be learned by what happened, is that when somebody tells you that you don't need evidence 
to respond, that it doesn't matter evidence, how many people uh, are experiencing racism in an organisation. Anybody who tells you that, it's drivel. And the fact that the left, and the left has leagues of academics, leagues of intellectuals who could look at this issue and construct a response which would actually effectively refute this. The problem was they didn't want to. They didn't want to, on an emotional level, I've already said, you know, we had a leader of the party who was the best vicar in politics that we've ever had. He wanted to be nice to people. So there was an emotional response to that. But he was also surrounded by a number of people who said, you know, even if you've got a problem with one person who's anti-Semitic, it's a major problem. The interesting thing is they didn't say that about Muslims and they didn't say that about black people. Now, why didn't Corbyn and the rest of them come out fighting on that? Why didn't they come out fighting for black people? Why didn't they come out fighting for Muslim people? And the reason that they didn't is exactly what Ford pointed to. There is a hierarchy of race. And that's astonishing that he even used that term because me using that term years ago was one of the reasons why I was expelled. And can I just finish by saying one thing on this? Uh, you know, you know, Tony quite rightly brings up this ludicrousness of the JBL. I mean, they're an embarrassment. If you've ever been to one of their training things... You mean JLM? The J the JLM, yeah. if, you've, if you've ever been to one of their training sessions, they are a total embar embarrassment. But that they have the sole copyright on how to give out training. And he said, you know, it should also be the JVL who do this. There should be other brokers in there. If you Again, if you read what the NEC have said that, about that, it is one of the things they're not even going to to discuss. Mm. Why? Why is it not even going to be discussed? Well, we know why it's not going to be discussed, because they want to preserve training for people in the Labour Party. It's not training, sorry. They want to make sure that Labour people are indoctrinated to know what they should and shouldn't say. That's all it is. And if you think that training is going to stop people from being anti-Semitic, then you're utterly balmy. It's going to make people anti-Semitic. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Um, I would take Crystal Wall uh, exception with you saying that the, the Labour Party is the most racist party in Britain. I think maybe UKIP or EDL or the Tories are probably a touch it's one, more it, racist. Uh, it's as, as racist. OK. Um, I mean, I said... In my experience, it was the most racist institution I've ever worked in. I haven't worked, and I said that, I haven't mm. been with the Tories. I don't know what they're like. I have no, you know, direct opinion on that. But I do know, for me, it was a terrible, awful experience. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Um, let's turn to Mark Wattsworth now. You've... you've um nodded heavily when Jackie was speaking on that. I was going to ask you something slightly different, though, which is the, um, the leaked report, um, which was produced, as Jackie said, by some people who are ex-members of the Alliance for Workers' Liberty, which has a particular political viewpoint. But I think more broadly, it was actually produced by people who wanted to defend Corbyn and who wanted to show the world uh, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, Jenny Formby are doing everything in their power and more. They're going to be doing more than is being asked of us to root out anti-Semitism. And here's the evidence. We are throwing Chris Williamson to the wolves. We're throwing Jackie Walker to the wolves. I mean, the leaked report is a, is a factional document, isn't it? Very much so. And I think we should call out the names. We should name the guilty. Carrie Murphy. Jenny Formby, Seamus Milne, James Schneider, and I think John Lansman was a part of it as well. They decided that they were going to throw red meat to the enemy. 
appease, apologise, capitulate, offer up Tony Greenstein, Jackie Walker, Chris Williamson, Ken Livingston and myself. And somehow that would call off the wolves. But we all know from history that if you do that, they'll come back for more. And they did. And what's so shocking for me about the leaked report is it actually fesses up on that. You've got messages coming from Lotto, the leader of the opposition's office, saying, can you speed up? Basically, you're chucking out Jackie, Tony, Mark, Ken and Chris. What sort of treachery is that? And I quote in the new edition of my book, Comrade Sack, Shapuji Sakrat Vale MP, a political biography. Tariq Ali, who's a close mate of Corbyn's. They talk, they're allies. It's someone he would listen to. And Tariq correctly said, he should have put up a fight. We might have lost, but we'd have made an impact. Mm -hmm. And there was no fight. There was just capitulation. Jeremy's closest friends and allies. I took a bullet for Jeremy Corbyn at the Chakrabarti uh, report launch. I got up and challenged one of the right-wing MPs who'd been part of the chicken coup. I think just the week before, 172 MPs that uh, voted uh, a motion of no confidence in, in the leader. Were we supported? Oh no, he dispatched Shami Chakrabarti mm. to go and apologise to Ruth Smith, the former director of BICOM, which is a pro-Israeli uh, lobbying political organisation in Britain, to go and apologise to Ruth Smith, who I'm supposed to have offended, one of the members of the chicken coup, at the Houses of Parliament. This is grovelling. And um, we feel aggrieved. And I don't think that Ford is what it's set up to be. I agree with Tony when he says that there's too much of on the one hand and on the other. Ford is good for us in the sense that it says that anti-Semitism was weaponised, that there is a hierarchy, as far as the Labour Party leadership are concerned, where privileged white Jews are at the top of the uh, pile, uh, black people are towards the bottom along with m Muslims, uh, it uh, talks about um, the factionalism that clearly existed and the right-wing faction that um, Jeremy Corbyn sadly appeased. He didn't fire Ian McNichol, that treacherous general secretary. It took him three years to do that. He didn't clear out the uh, shithouse mm. that was head office. South side, some of us call it dark side. <laughs> you know, the Buckinghams, the John Stollardays, the Dan Hogan's, the Sam Matthews. They should have been cleared out. You know, they were stabbing us in the back. Tom Watson was stabbing us in the back. He was taking instructions from, uh, what's Mandelson's first name? I can't even Peter. bloody remember his Peter. first name. I've been fighting that bastard since the 80s when he was the Prince of Darkness supporting uh, that right-winger, Neil Kinnock, who hated the black sections and black people in the Labour Party and got rid of Martha Ossimore in Vauxhall, Brixton, got rid of Sharon Atkin in Nottingham East. The man is a racist. He got rid of two fine left-wing black women. And I've seen the evidence. I've been to the National Labour Party archive in Salford and see that Neil Kinnock personally took charge at the NEC of getting rid of those two black women. I rest my case. Mm. Thanks, Mark. Um, Tony, um, from that perspective of the leaked report and the, the way that, you know, Corbyn's supporter tried really, tried everything to show that 
we're doing everything against anti-Semitism that we can. We're throwing comrades to the wolves, etc. Do you think it's somewhat ironic that then Corbyn got done in the end for saying pretty much exactly the same thing Chris Williamson was expelled for? Anti-Semitism was weaponized. That's in the end Corbyn's crime for well, why he lost the whip. It's a great tragedy. Uh, that Corbyn ran with the idea that if you deny that there is an anti-Semitism problem, then you're part of that problem. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, I've given the analogy before. It's like you appear in court charged with, I don't know, grievous bodily harm. You just plead not guilty and the judge immediately says, well, denying what you've done is in itself proof that you have done it. I mean, it, it, it was an absolute nonsense. I mean... And yes, Corbyn went... I mean, I agree with Mark. I mean, Corbyn went along with everything. I mean, I, I read page 306 and page 333 of the leaked report where Lotto and Corbyn urged them to get on with the expulsions of Mark, me, Ken and Jackie and says that's the way to build trust with Jewish stakeholders mm -hmm. and that the Jew Jewish labour movement is very aggrieved that nothing has been done already. Well, we were forced out, expelled. Did that build trust? Of course not. They came back for more scalps uh, and more. And then you had Jenny Formby boasting that she'd increased the number of expulsions exponentially compared to uh, McNichol. And it's true, McNichol was inefficient compared to her. But what did it do? It just proved there was an anti-Semitism problem. Whereas there was no anti-Semitism problem. Of course, there were a few anti-Semites, and you can magnify them out of all proportion. Yeah. But there always have been. But it wasn't focused on for years, and suddenly under Corbyn, it became a problem. It, there was no phenomena. The narrative was wrong. And Corbyn never saw, and those around him are more guilty in a sense, McDonnell in particular, mm -hmm. they never saw what it was about which was a determined campaign to remove a left leader of the Labour Party who threatened their interests. Uh, and it was really as simple as that. If I can reply briefly to Jackie Walker on racial awareness training, I was specifically focusing on the rat, as uh, Stephen Anden calls it, yeah. uh, with, for police, prison officers, other in, uh, parts of the coercive state. I wasn't talking about cleaners and others who, with whom you may well have a very good discussion, uh, etc. But in terms of the police, uh, Stephen Anden pointed out, all it does is make them target black people all the better and know the language to do it in so they're not accused of racism. Uh, I think it's totally counterproductive because, of course, their racism doesn't revolve around ideas in their head. It comes from their, their role in the state. They're the ones who enforce the deportations. They're the ones who patrol black areas, etc. They're coercive and racist by definition. Uh, and of course, there's been no change in the police force or, or the immigration service, etc. So in their terms, I mean, uh, that was completely counterproductive. But I, I accept if, if you're going to have an education about racism uh, for working class people, then yes, it's very good, but uh, on the, in terms of the anti-Semitism training, having the Jewish labour movement give training on anti-Semitism uh, is it, like Nick Griffin giving a lecture about multiculturalism in modern-day Britain, or, or Harold yeah. Shipman giving a lecture about care for the elderly. You know, it's an utter absurdity. I'm sure Jackie agrees with that. Jackie, do you want to come back in? Yeah, I certainly do agree with that, and I, I actually think... This issue about denialism, that, that, that was something that could have been, like I said, so easily refuted. I've just been to see a wonderful play at the National Theatre. It really brought tears to my eyes, and I recommend it to anyone to go and see it if you can get tickets. It's called The Crucible. And one of the issues oh, yeah. about any witch hunt, it's an essential part of the witch hunt, that if you deny mm -hmm. uh, evidence, then you are guilty. guilty. And as soon as that happens, we should have known that was wrong. But, uh, you know, I do also think the whole issue of what, what has happened, what happened with the leak report and then subsequently the Ford report is also involved with the exception, uh, uh, sorry, with the acceptance of the IHRA. You know, as soon as the IHRA 
was accepted as a structure within which the Labour Party was going to work and all sorts of other things became consequential. And now we are, as they say, where we are, and we have that now. Mm. So, um, but I do think if one of the other lessons that we've got to learn, and this, this is going on from what Mark says, I think it was Mark said it might have been Tony, was that issue that had we fought it, we probably would have lost, mm -hmm. but we have been left in a darn sight better state than we are now. Yep. And what I would like to see, and I plead for it, I plead for it, if for John McConnell or Jeremy Corbyn at some point to actually speak to the movement and say, we should have done things differently. And this is where we should have done things differently. Because until that's done, then we'll keep on having these discussions. Navarra Media will keep on pretending it's never happened. Ooh. And we will see where we are. And Jackie, I'm um, talking about John Lansman, uh, sorry, John McDonnell and John Lansman, actually. I think it's, it's quite important we take a closer look at, at our leaders and, and what they did. Um, John Lansman, we showed a little clip the other day in, in our uh, Red Lion TV show. John Lansman outlined what for him anti-Semitism is, and he used the example of somebody saying, I hate Israel. That is anti-Semitism for him. And coupled with John McDonald's um, policy, which was adopted, of zero tolerance, that leads to anybody saying anything mm. critical of Israel is out. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think our leaders, these, these mistakes of our leaders, they, are, they should apologize really for, for doing that. I, I, I somehow don't, don't see it happening. But the zero tolerance approach, I think that's been a real problem for our movement since. What do you think? Um, well, well, first of all, I think there's a real difference between John Landsman and John McDonald. Uh, and this is my personal experience of them. I think John Landsman believed what he was saying. Mm. He properly believed what he was saying. Now, I'm not saying what he was saying is right. It's all it's obvious it. nonsense. It's obvious it's drivel fun. and nonsense. Where I think, I think John McDonnell, on the other hand, I think, I think what he thought he was doing was politically expedient and that somehow he would... He would be able to work on this landsman style project which was to bring together zionism and the labor party into a happy sort of living together and i think uh so i think the two the two men were were different in 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 what happened and i actually funnily enough i don't want an apology i don't think we need an apology I think we just need, if you like, a review and an admission and some reflection. And it's almost starting to happen on the fringes of the optics left. They're being pushed towards it. And as time goes by and increasing evidence comes out, and to some extent, as this, if you like, this period becomes less and less important to the establishment and more evidence comes out, I think this will happen more and more. I think we'll see in 10, 15 years' time, people will be writing papers on this saying, well, this was nonsense. This was absolutely ridiculous. What we need now is we need our leaders to be doing it. And it's no good, you know, having your peace campaign and standing up and you know, having tears because everybody's being nice to you. There's more to being a leader than that. Yeah. There's also looking at the consequences of what your leadership did. And and look, what, what Corbyn had to take, what Corbyn had to handle was more than most people would have had to. And he did extraordinary things. But this is also his responsibility to do. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Mark, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I wanted to come in to say, in a way, the uh, Ford report 
response has been hijacked by people who are talking about the abuse that certain black MPs have faced. But more egregious for me is that the way that Tony was treated, the way that Jackie was treated, Chris Williamson, Ken Livingston. We're the grassroots, we're the rank and file. And the people making a noise at the moment don't be, seem to be concerned about that. All right, I know, and I had this discussion with uh, Tony before we came here. That wasn't a part of the Ford Report brief. But they could have nodded in the direction uh, of saying that there were certain people uh, in the witch hunt who were treated appallingly in terms of injustice. They could have, and they didn't. And that, that for me, is a flaw in Ford. And so we shouldn't go too gung-ho on saying how wonderful Ford is. Mm. Tony, um, the, the idea of what Jackie was just discussing, the, that John McDonnell thought he could get in, into bed with Zionism, and that's one way to kind of go into Downing Street number 10. And then, I don't know, when you're there, you presumably, you shed it or something. <laughs> what was the plan? Do you think there was a plan? I think there was a vague hope, uh, but which crystallised into a strategy, if that's what you could call it, mm. that the only way to get into government was to appease the right, to make, almost to make it clear to them that you wouldn't actually be a threat to British capitalism. The problem w with that was obvious. The, the right were not going to accept Corbyn at any price. Imagine he'd got an overall majority of two or three. Then, you know, the, the right 50 MPs would say we're not supporting Corbyn as Prime Minister. You know, so there was no possibility. The only possibility was to have re-selection, the uh, open selection. Corbyn opposed that in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. And at that conference, I turned to Chris Williams and, and said, because I was speaking on the same platform as him at the Royal uh, Fringe meeting, and I said, Corbyn has just signed his own death warrant. Mm. Yet yeah, that was the last chance, was to get rid of so many right-wing Labour MPs that you had the possibility of a strong socialist contingent in Parliament. Once Corbyn had retreated on that, he had retreated on everything. Mm. And so he just simply went along with everything they did. He, every time they accused him of anti-Semitism, he apologised. <laughs> and he apologised again and again. But, you know, they weren't talking about anti-Semitism. That wasn't what was bothering them. Zionism has never fought anti-Semitism. Why should it now? They were talking about Israel and Palestinians. Uh, and that was the key issue. And McDonald has got it wrong when, uh, or Landsman, when he says hate Israel is anti-Semitic. Why? Uh, are you really associating all Jews with Israel? I mean, to me, that is anti-Semitic. To say that Jews here bear a responsibility for what Israel does. Uh, someone who says, I hate Nazi Germany, I hate Israel, I hate South Africa. That's just shorthand for you hate apartheid or racism. Uh, but then the landsman sold the pass. He was, in essence, a Jewish racist, an exclusivist. He bought into all of that. He knew what he was doing because he was a previously an anti-Zionist. He did know what the Board of Deputies was like, but he retreated and rode back mm. uh, and made, along with Owen Jones, who's another rat, if you like. I mean, the <laughs> Owen Jones, in the height of the Operation Protective Edge, when 2,200 Palestinians were killed by Israel in Gaza, including 550 children. Owen Jones writes an article starting off with, anti-Semitism is a menace. I'm sorry. What had anti-Semitism to do with it? There was no anti-Semitism then. But of course the Zionists, had the, that was their only card. So, I mean, Corbyn did blow it. He said he's made mistakes but he hasn't quantified or clarified what those mistakes were. And actually, they weren't mistakes. It was far greater than a mistake. You know, I mean, if I feel in a form wrong, that's a mistake. Uh, this was a, a catastrophic error. Mm -hmm. It is, though, uh, probably this is a strategy of the official Labour left, and it has been for decades, mm -hmm. isn't it? You have to try and appease the right. We have to... Mm -hmm 
the Labour Party has two wings, and that's correct. The right doesn't think the Labour Party no, should have two wings. No. The right is quite happy to fight the left tooth and nail, as we have seen. Mm. But it, the left, the, the official Labour left, still clings to this weird idea that we need two wings. No, we don't. We should reclaim the Labour Party as the Labour, as the party of the working class. It could be transformed into something quite, quite different, or could have. It's, it's a question if that ship has sailed now. Um, I want to just quickly talk to Jackie one, one more. Uh, last time. Um, the strategy of appeasement has seen, of course, as Tony says, open selection being uh, dropped by Corbyn or not fought for. Corbyn uh, stopped fighting for tri against Trident, that was dropped. Um, abolition of the monarchy in the House of Lords, those ki kind of questions were seen as problematic uh, to, get into, to get into Downing Street number 10. But pre let's presume he actually had gotten in Let's presume we've had, had a Corbyn government and lots of people thought that would be it, that would be the way to socialism. But the, the state would have thrown quite a lot of things. We've got, we've got an inkling of that when that general uh, said we would have a mutiny. The army would mutiny against a general Jeremy Corbyn. What do you think could have, uh, what would have awaited a, a government of Jeremy Corbyn? That is as you know weak as as it was well one of the things that i i seriously think would have we would have seen very possibly would have been an assassination attempt on oh. jeremy Corbyn, and you know that would be very easy uh, uh to uh for that to have been organized by all sorts of people who wanted to see him uh, not there but i think apart from that yes you would have had all sorts of shenanigans from the par parliamentary Labour Party who probably would have refused to support him. You would have seen a run on the pound. You would have seen the involvement of the CIA. You would have seen, not seen, of course, that was happening, but they would have got the empty on that. You would have seen the CIA. You would have seen all those players coming up. The only way we could get past that would have had would have been to have an overwhelmingly powerful grassroots mm. movement. And that's what momentum was supposed to be yeah. building. And that's the crime of what happened with momentum was that that was disabled. And what we see now really is a rump momentum we see them now that they'll, they'll just continue to get smaller and smaller yeah. i mean you know one of the reasons that they still survive is that they've got what i would call legacy funding and they've also got funding from trade unions and, and people like that but they're going to become a less and less effective group because they don't have the grassroots movement with them anymore mm. Thanks, Jackie. I mean, it is um, probably questionable if, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the election of jo uh, Jeremy Corbyn was an accident, really, mm. wasn't it? The, the, the movement wasn't actually there to sustain a left-wing government, It wasn't perhaps. totally an accident. I mean, my four, well, how old was he? he was, yeah, he was 14, my youngest son, James. He was one of thousands of people who went onto Facebook urging demanding that their MP nominate Jeremy Corbyn. So there was a momentum behind it, and I think that did create uh, a belief amongst certain MPs that, yes, you can't s stop him standing. It is, after all, an election, and that's what democracy is about. So I don't think it was totally an accident. And there was also a revulsion at Cameron's election as Prime Minister on the second lowest ever vote, I think, in, in, in British elections. He got an overall majority because the Liberals uh, jackknifed, basically, after uh, ratting out on the student. They pledged not to support an increase in fees. So, 
it was a fluke that Cameron got elected and people were really pissed off with that. Mm-hmm. And that crystallised into the support for Jeremy Corbyn. The problem is he didn't make of it what he could have done. But he also, I mean, had he won the election, I mean, he wouldn't have... Lots of people thought he would introduce socialism, but for that you need, you no, know, no. a majority, a vast majority of the working no, class. No, you have to yeah. challenge the state. I mean, he, clearly he wasn't doing that. He'd rode back on lots of that. But for the capitalists, the ruling class, that wasn't enough. I mean, mm. even moderate reforms now are considered revolutionary and a challenge to their power. After all, you look at Liz Truss. Mm. She has a budget redistributing income in favour of the already super rich. Mm. Just to sum up, we've got a few more minutes left. Um, Tony, your key lesson for the left of the defeat of the Corbyn movement. What do we have to do to avoid that happening again? Well, you don't appease your enemies. I mean, that, mm. that is the key lesson. And you don't abandon your principles. Open selection should have been a principle. Corbyn abandoned anti-imperialism, anti-Zionism. That is a key principle. Anti-racism. Unfortunately, the Labour left have no coherent ideology, and so they go along with what's on offer. And all this identity politics of anti-Semitism. When were they ever? When was the Daily Mail ever concerned about anti-Semitism? It, it opposed the Jewish refugees coming into this country uh, before the Second World War. Uh, the idea that it was suddenly concerned with anti-Semitism now, please, mm. give me a break. Thanks, Tony. Mark, for you, the, the key lessons of the last seven, is it eight long, long years yet? It feels like a lifetime, doesn't it? That you stand up and fight. Mm. That when you're a Labour left leader, you so- surround yourself with... Uh, working class advisors, people who have come up through the class struggle in the trade unions. They were a bunch of public school boys, including Corbyn. Schneider went to Winchester. Seamus Milne went to Winchester. You know, what sort of fighting advice could these posh boys give to posh boy Corbyn? I'm going to be a bit um, iconoclastic. I think it was the wrong lot. We needed fighters in there. Whatever you say about Alistair Campbell, when he was heading up things as a spin doctor, chief spin doctor for Tony Blair, uh, people in Fleet Street in broadcast didn't like him, but they bloody respected him as a former Daily Mirror uh, political uh, editor. People at The Guardian didn't even like Seamus Milne. People treated him as a joke. And so I think there were errors, not just in terms of tactics and strategy, but in terms of personnel. What's that old saying? You judge someone by the friends they keep. And they were the wrong friends. And he certainly didn't support his true friends and allies. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, also, I'd look, like to go back to Jackie and Duncan. Duncan, first, what's, I mean, I did ask you this question before. What, do you have another lesson, perhaps, f- listening to our discussion? Have you changed your mind a little bit? That is another lesson to be learned. No, not, no. not especially. Um, I mean, I agree with actually a great deal of what was said, um, particularly a lot of Tony's comment in relation to the, the mistakes that were made. Um, I mean, that's been my feeling as well, that there was an opportunity there with Jeremy as the leader of the party and he, the ball was dropped very badly um, over things like uh, reconstituting the PLP. I mean, one of the first things Blair did when he got uh, into into uh, the leadership in 94 was he actually then spent time on reconstituting the people that were going into the PLP. So that in the 97 election, there was that cadre of Blairites that were elected to Westminster, some of whom, you know, then they passed on to others. And you you have a collection of the PLP that broadly, even if Corbyn had won the election, there would have been great difficulty in getting any radical policy through because you'd have had a PLP that would have resisted it. So that'd be one of them. Open selection would be an obvious one and various other mistakes that were made. And I think the other massive mistake is that the party structure, the party system, the operation of the party should have been taken seriously as one of the first things that needed to be done, not worrying about the external stuff. The first move should have been to sort the party out. When you get into control of the boat, it's not the first thing to worry about where you're going. The first thing you do is fill the holes that are filling the boat with water. When you sort that out, then you, you choose the direction that you're going to head in. 
So that'd be my big lesson from it. No. But I don't think we're going to get another chance. So Labour's probably stuffed. Quite, <laughs> quite agree. Ian McNichol should have been uh, sacked. The he day offered after. to resign. And he offered to resign. Yes, it was uh, crazy. Also, of course, the, one of the last actions of Corbyn was to offer Tom, Tom Watson a seat in the House of Lords. With. Look at that. He put McNichol in the House of Lords. In McNichol Where were well. the black people? Yeah. Where were the women? Yeah, we want it's to go not back just to... about race and class. It was about race, class and gender. Yep. Jackie, your last words on this, your, your big lesson for the last seven years. Yeah, I mean, my, my, uh, but I think it always, doesn't it, comes down to solidarity and then we really have to learn to be a little bit more, or maybe a lot more ruthless. Yeah, absolutely. I think ruthlessness is <laughs> undervalued. <laughs> Absolutely. On that happy note. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, comrades. That was a brilliant discussion, actually. I really enjoyed right. that. Yeah, it was uh, great. Great. See you soon.